रेगुलर कर दो ओके वी आर स्टार्टिंग विद द लेक्चर नाउ आवर टुडेस लेक्चर इज ऑडियोलॉजी एंड इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स सो दिस विल बी योर लास्ट लेक्चर फॉर आवर दिस टर्म ओके from the next time onwards we'll start with the new term so all six term students will enter the seventh term student seventh term and seventh term student will appear for the exam okay so this is the lecture about the audiology and the instrument so first thing in audiology what is audiology it is branch of science that studies hearing balance and related disorders audiology is the discipline involved in identification and evaluation of hearing disorder selection evaluation of hearing aids hearing conversations programs and rehabilitation of individual with hearing and balance disorder so audiology mainly concerned with the hearing and rehabilitation of hearing understood but it also includes speech because speech and hearing are the uh, go hand in hand okay if the hearing is normal then only your speech will develop so that is why uh, speech and hearing is uh, go hand in hand it is interrelated now what is uh, hearing disorder how will you identify hearing disorders by doing various test now this test are divided into two types cutler uh, it is subjective and objective test what is subjective test subjective test where the patient's cooperation is important if the subject says he can't hear he can't hear we cannot do anything okay he may malinger he may lie he, he do anything okay so that is a subject uh, subjective test method requires the patients to volunteer a response so we have to depend on patient's response we will not come to know whatever it is okay so objective test objective test are more reliable what are they these are the methods don't necessarily require active cooperation or any kind of behavioral response for the patient by the patient so we'll come to know by the uh, behavior so what are the common subjective tests subjective test is basically audiometry what is it pure tone audiometry there are different types behavioral audiometry virtual response audiometry play audiometry conventional audiometry which we do pi up and tend down so conventional this is a common question asked in practical uh, when do you start doing pure tone audiometry ideally we can do from 2 years because patient's cooperation is necessary okay if you can convince the patient and patient is giving response we can do from 2 years to 5 year 2 years onwards but ideally it is to be done after 5 years okay so older than 5 years to patient sent to the pure tone audiometry then Uh, it is also done for the tinnitus evaluation then objective test objective test inc includes emittance that is same as impedance audiometry which includes tympanometry and reflo acoustic reflex then oe bera and other things okay so at least uh, this much you remember objective test and subjective test which are subjective which are objective then these are the tuning fork test i'm not going into detail of this tuning fork test okay because we have already discussed it many times rinnes test weber's test okay schwabach test ha this you uh, may be interested this is the uh, asked in uh, practicals also what is chimani moose test basically all this test first three tests which we have discussed is rinnes weber's and schwabach i am not going into detail but these are the tests which are done routinely understood then there are certain tests which we don't do routinely but these are helpful helpful when when the patient is malingering so these are the tests which will tell us whether the patient is malingering or not okay so this is a uh, chimani moose test what is it this is actually a modification of weber's test nothing but a weber's test when the vibrating fork is placed on the vertex the patient indicates that he hears uh, it in a good ear and not in the deaf ear suppose patient is malingering patient is saying there is left ear deafness is there but actually he can hearing hearing is normal on both sides okay but he is saying that there is hearing loss on the left side so what we'll do we'll do the weber's test weber test what we are doing we are checking the bone conduction so bone conduction we are checking which will not be affected by air conduction understood so what we'll do is weber's test weber's test means 
uh, once we do webus test we'll ask suppose a patient is saying left sided audio uh, deafness so what we'll do is we'll upload the left sided uh, audio external auditory canal so what will happen patient will feel genuine patient will say able to lateralize the sound to the good ear the uh, test will not change okay for the genuine patient but malingering what will you will say he doesn't know bone and uh, bone conduction air conduction so what he say he, he what he feels is now ear is blocked so i should hear in the other ear understood so he will give the wrong this and by this we'll come to know whether the patient is malingering or not this is just as being test already done for autosclerosis we have discussed that so after that we'll go to pure tone audiometry what is pure tone audiometry for that we'll have to understand the normal hearing mechanism we hear by conductive mechanism as well as sensory neural mechanism conductive mechanism is normally see this is divided into outer ear middle ear cochlea and ethna understood so this is how the ear is it is very much diagrammatic okay so just for your understanding so for air conduction what we do air conduction goes from outer ear middle ear then to cochlea and then to stomach nerve whereas bone conduction what happens bone conduction the whole skull is placed into vibration in air conduction uh, air in the external auditory canal vibrates then the tympanic membrane vibrates then attached to tympanic membrane are ossicles so ossicles vibrate and then uh, sound is transferred to the inner ear that is how the uh, sound goes to cochlea but there is a relative movement basically at the oval window and the uh, inner ear and then that is how the hair cells are stimulated but in skull what happens is ossicles are uh, they are not moving okay they are static and skull is moving because vibrating tuning fork is placed over the bone okay so bones are moving and not the ossicles ossicles are still uh, there uh, static only okay so what will happen bone conduction the sound directly goes to cochlea it doesn't uh, matter whether the outer ear is normal middle ear is normal or not okay because the bone conduction sound will directly go to cochlea and the seventh nerve understood so normal what will happen air conduction is better than bone conduction understood so normally what we hear is air conduction and not the bone conduction okay then conductive deafness what will happen the outer ear either is affected or the middle ear so wax or the csom and other those conditions can affect the outer ear and middle ear so what will happen air conduction is impaired whereas what will happen to bone conduction bone conduction is normal so ac is less than the bc understood bc is normal bone conduction is normal but ac is impaired whereas in sensory neural hearing loss what will happen air conduction is normal but cochlea is different so whatever sound air conduction or bone conduction is going to the cochlea since this part is defective will not be heard understood so air conduction as well as bone conduction both are decreased in sensory neural hearing loss mixed hearing loss what will happen air conduction is impaired as well as bone conduction is impaired both are decreased understood air conduction and bone conduction these are the universal symbols which are seen in the audiogram what you have to remember is red indicates right ear blue indicates left ear understood even if you understand if you remember this you will understand air, air conduction is always circular uh, fully gola okay that is what we call it and right conduction is less than and more than okay if you remember this two first two that is also more than enough for you ug level so how we do the pure tone audiometry what method is followed here okay so first of all soundproof room is there with two uh, room set up okay and patient is Uh, given sound and then he is asked to raise the hand okay from which ear he is hearing so in my, while doing audiometry we starts with the higher tones okay so 30 decibel sounds are there we give to the patient ask the patient oh, to only one ear eh? not do, uh, both the ears so patient will say yes if patient can hear it we go 10 levels down okay go to 20 levels similarly if he, if he can still hear then we go 10 levels down okay but at this level if the patient is not able to hear we have to increase the sound and that is 5 up so this method is called as 10 down and 5 up okay 
so this is the method same thing what we are doing is we are going down by 10 but we are going up by 5 we are going down by 10 if we can't hear we going up again if you can hear go down by 10 okay like that and and then you, then you take two see this is there okay when you patient consistent you can at this level he can hear properly because it's consistent uh, response should be there okay lowest level two out of three should be taken as a norm so here is the audiogram what you are seeing is a x-axis is a frequency in hertz as wide axis is decibel level understood so 0 to 10 decibel it is almost normal both air conduction and bone conduction are normal so this is a normal uh, audiogram hearing ranges ac and dc both between uh, between 0 to 20 decibel all in all frequencies okay then next is conductive hearing loss in conductive hearing loss we have already seen that the bone conduction is normal see we have seen that bone conduction is always less than and greater than whereas air conduction is fully gola okay so this is fully across okay so that is the head so bone conduction is normal air conduction is decreased air bone gap is more than 10 decibel so it is conductive deafness so same thing is here abnormality or disease of the outer ear and the middle ear we have seen those blocks okay ac scores poorer than the bc so bc is normal basically air ac is decreased and air bone gap more than 10 decibel conductive hearing loss in sensory neural hearing loss what happens air conduction as well as bone conduction is also affected because the cochlea and the eighth nerve is affected so both are decreased hearing loss resulting from abnormality and on pathology affecting the cochlea and the auditory nerve air conduction scores equal to bone conduction and air bone gap is less than 10 decibel that is more important air bone gap is less okay in mixed hearing loss, what will happen? See, these are the two things which we should see whenever you are reading audiogram. First, you see the air conduction, you see the bone conduction, and third thing is air bone, con air bone gap. So, these three conditions will tell you whether uh, your hearing is normal, abnormal, conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, or mixed hearing loss. Here, what happens? Air conduction is decreased. See, fully gola. Okay. So, air conduction is decreased. What happened to bone conduction? Bone conduction is also decreased. And what happens to air bone gap? It is increased. Definitely it is increased. So it is it, uh, so it is sensory neural hearing loss plus uh, conductive hearing loss. Okay. So that is why it is mixed hearing loss. Then different types of audiogram based on the types of hearing loss. Uh, these are again uh, same thing, but audiometric, real hearing. Same thing which I have told you. Hearing loss resulting from the external middle as well as inner, inner ear pathology. So bone conduction, air conduction scores are abnormal limits, and air bone conduction, uh, air bone gap is low, more than 10 decibel. Then noise induced hearing loss. Hearing loss resulting from abnormality affecting the cochlea and auditory nerve at high frequency region. So basically noise induced hearing loss, there is a dip at the 4K. Okay, so high frequency is basically affected, especially 3 to 6. So dip is at the 4K level. So that is the a very characteristic of the, okay, of the noise induced hearing loss. Now, what is interoral attenuation okay or how the sound will be carried to other ear crossover so non-test ear of the patient what will happen is see this is the normal patient we are testing the right ear we are non-testing the left ear so stimulus will be given to the right ear this is non-test ear but though we are giving stimulus to the test ear only right ear only the sum sum will go because from air it travels and goes to the other ear also so other ear is also stimulated okay so what we are seeing both the ears are stimulated and this is <coughs> sorry crossover or the interoral attenuation and that is why rene false negative <laughs> is there sound is presented to the right ear non-test so what we need 
to do to this interoral attenuation to block this interoral attenuation we have to do the masking okay masking uh, noise is presented to the left here this is the uh, how the graph is and depending on that okay then we'll see the tympanometry and then we'll go to audiograms which are present in this department okay impedance audiometry basically is a, a two type of uh, hey. first is tympanogram and second is first is tympanogram and second is acoustic reflex okay and it is a objective test that is the main a main advantage of the impedance audiometry you will get short note for impedance audiometry it will not be kept for practicals but short note definitely you will get so what will we what will what will examine or investigate in the impedance audiometry what all things we see first is ear canal volume volume the equivalent ear canal volume usually what happens eustachian tube function is there and normal uh, the atmospheric pressure is maintained on both sides of the tympani membrane understood then tympanometry is testing methodology that is used to evaluate functions of the middle ear as i said there are different types of curves okay jerger has uh, specifically described these curves in type a type b and type c type a is again divided into normal autosclerotic and the ossicular chain discontinuity tympanogram provides several information including compliance of the middle ear system eardrum movement ear canal volume middle ear pressure interpretation of tympanogram so normally what we'll see is a c here is the graph okay so on this side there is a pressure middle ear pressure can you see this is a normal zero pressure so see the peak is at the normal that is zero this is the minus and this is a positive pressure okay then minus pressure is usually a station tube obstruction and this is a compliance or the remittance actually but it is uh, ultra of impedance so it is a uh, compliance what we measure here so what we get is peak is there sharp peak is there and the middle ear pressure is normal so peak and the compliance and the middle ear pressure that is what we are going to see so this is normal what happens in autosclerosis autosclerosis what will happen compliance because there is thickening of the foot plate so what will happen compliance will be reduced the movement of the step is foot plate is reduced so as it increases what will happen to uh, comp uh, compliance see it was sharp curve normally so it has flattened okay so there is no movement and advanced autosclerosis you get the flat okay but still uh, if you can appreciate middle ear pressure is normal understood so that is a in ad what will happen there is a lot of movement there is ossicular chain discontinuity so malleus is moving in tympanic membrane is moving uh, uh, this is there there is no fixity okay of the ossicular chain so what will happen there is a lot of movement so compliance will be increased and that is what is seen in the this okay see like this many times the peak is very high and what you see is a two lines only but still the middle ear pressure is normal if you can appreciate so a is middle ear pressure is normal understood type b what happens now here mm. type b is a secretory otitis media so there is no peak uh, the whole middle ear cavity is filled with the uh, secretions or the fluid understood so compliance will be will not be there or it is decreased mainly okay and even the a uh, middle ear pressure is on the negative side understood so that is type b or seen in secretory type c what happens peak is there compliance is there but negative pressure is normal negative pressure is not normal it is negative so it is uh, eustachian tube obstruction understood so type a you have seen as autosclerosis ad discontinuity b is secretory otitis media c is um your station tube obstruction you have to remember this type types and where it is seen okay a autosclerosis discontinuity b in secretory otitis media c is in station tube obstruction understood so these are the three types of curve in tympanic membrane perforation what will happen tympanic membrane perforation pressure cannot be built inside the middle ear pressure middle ear and the external artery canal so there is no peak so we cannot assess the pressure 
Now we'll go to audiograms which are available in our department, especially for seven term students, you should be listening. For six term, there will be again revision. Okay. For uh, seven term students, you have to, whenever you are reading the X ray, uh, sorry, audiogram, how you, uh, how you read. Okay. There is a method for each and everything. So whenever you are reading the audiogram, you should read with the name, age, sex. Okay. So this is a. Uh, whatever it is name and uh, middle aged male nee, elderly male patient hearing loss is uh, patient presented with hearing loss in both the ears see this hearing loss in both the ears and complaints of tinnitus is present okay what you are seeing always identify air conduction plus bone conduction then okay so what happens to air conduction air conduction as i've said it is fully gola so red is right ear and left is blue or the black it's okay so that is for, uh, red ear this is air conduction which is definitely decreased whereas bone conduction is also decreased less than and greater than okay same thing okay and what you are seeing is more in the higher frequencies this is more in the higher frequencies this is elderly 65 year old male patient with history of tinnitus so diagnosis is more likely to be press by accuses okay then the uh, relation uh, then the discussion will go on how the patient will present and what is the treatment remember here treatment is hearing aid and not cochlear implant okay treatment is hearing aid treatment is hearing aid see again and again i am repeating this same audiogram it is then this is the audiogram of uh, next audiogram so this is the audiogram of male 42 year presenting with tinnitus in both the ears there is no complaint of hearing loss here only the tinnitus is there so first always identify air conduction so this is the air conduction it is increased in higher frequencies again this is the bone conduction and what you can see is a 4k dip okay it is more in this Okay, hearing and 4K dip is there. Similarly, even right uh, left side is also same audiogram because it is noise exposed. So both the ears are exposed to noise, and that is why uh, this typical 4K dip is seen. Okay, because the inner ear will be affected more. Cochlea, as you know, the cochlea different frequencies are uh, represented at different levels. Basal frequencies are affected. Basal uh, Turn is affected where uh, by, uh, perceives the sensation of only the low, uh, uh, lower frequencies. Higher is a, a, okay, a pical low. So accordingly, which area is damaged? Accordingly, you get. Then this is a patient. Uh, sorry, audiogram of the male patient, middle aged, 25 years with the history of diminished hearing and otorrhea. History of otorrhea is there. Okay. So ear discharge is there. So what you'll do is this is a air conduction. This is a bone conduction. Fully gola is air conduction. See, this is the air conduction. This is the bone conduction. And the air bone gap on the right side is more than 10 decibel. Okay. So bone conduction is normal. Air conduction is decreased. Air bone gap is more. So it is right conductive hearing loss. Since there is history of otorrhea, okay, and diminished hearing, so more likely diagnosis is chronic separative otitis medium. So that is how you're going to talk in your exams. Okay. This is a middle aged female. Okay. 36 year old female patient with complaint of decreased hearing. Hearing loss is there and which is progressive. Okay. So progressive hearing loss. Again, you see what you see is a air conduction. Okay. Fully goda air conduction and less than is the bone conduction less than and greater than understood plus there is air bone gap okay this is air this is bone and air bone gap is there okay so what will happen what is there both sided conductive hearing loss now this type of hearing loss you describe it as a symmetrical bilateral symmetrical conductive hearing loss with more dip in the bone conduction understood see this bone conduction there is 2k this notch is there okay at 2000 hertz there is a notch in the bone conduction not 2000 hertz there is a notch in the bone conduction this is known as 
Kerhart's notch. And why it is there? It is because of inertia of the stapes that you have to remember. These are the words which should be used in the exams. Inertia of the stapes, because of that, there is a Kerhart's notch. So that's all about audiogram. Next, we'll move to the instruments. So first, we'll finish with the OPD instruments which are used. So what are the instruments? I think you can, everyone can identify this. What is it? It is a first instrument is a lax tongue depressor. OK, so can you see this is a lax tongue depressor? OK, what is the shape? It is a L shape with this end. It is little turn. OK, how you hold it? You hold it like this. OK, so I'll show you. This is a lax tongue depressor and you're going to see it like this. I don't know whether you're able to see it. I'll just check. You're you going to hold it like this. Understood? So this is how you're going to hold it with your uh, little finger here and the index finger here. And this is the action. OK, this is a lever like action. You are not depressing. Suppose this is my tongue. OK, understood. This is my tongue. You are not depressing it like this. It is very difficult to depress the tongue like this. OK, because it is a muscular uh, muscular structure. So you are going to depress it like this, like liver like action. OK, not the full thing. So it is it should be like this. Understood? So that is how you should. do. So this is lax tongue depressor where it is used. It is used in. It is used in uh, examination of oral cavity, oropharynx. The uh, uses in nose we have seen in one of the lectures. What are they? Two uses are there. First is uh, misting. Uh, is there? Nantar, nantar. They are like, hey, eh? what to say? So the use uh, dip, uh, this is there. So you examination of oral cavity. Yeah, I use this in nose. First is air blast test and second is posterior rhinoscopy. These are the two uses of lung depressor, tongue depressor in the nose. Okay. Then you know, of course surgery is also is used, tonsillectomy and other things. Then what is this? This is a 30 comes nasal speculum. Everyone should know how to hold it. I'll just show you how to hold it. OK, so see this is a 30 comes tongue, no, tongue uh, depressed. Sorry, 30 comes nasal speculum. It has got U shaped spring and two blades are there. OK, these two blades are there. how to hold it. See, this blade should be pointing towards your elbow. What is the problem? Anyone is unmute. Everyone mute their uh, speakers. So what is there? This is a tongue depressor blades and the U-shaped spring is there. How to hold it? See this blades are facing towards your elbow. OK, in the index finger you are holding it. Then uh, index finger and thumb will hold the uh, instrument. OK, and then the middle finger and the index finger and then you turn it like this. OK, approximate. This is how you hold it and this is how you do it. Everyone should know the. Uh, how to hold the tongue depressor. What are the structures seen is the commonly asked question. So it is inferior turbinate, middle turbinate, inferior meatus, middle meatus, nasal cavity, anterior part, nasal septum, anterior part of the nasal septum. OK, so these are the structures seen and structures. Um, yeah. Then what are the other nasal speculums? You know that is also one of the question asked. That is the St. Clair's nasal speculum is there. It is long bladed. It is same like thirty thumbs, but the blades are long. 
then uh, Killian's uh, nasal speculum. These are the three nasal speculum, but Thadikam's nasal speculum is the only speculum which is used without anesthesia. The two nasal speculums we have to give local anesthesia or some anesthesia. Understood? So what is this? This is a oral speculum. Okay, oral speculum is introduced into the cartilaginous part of the external artery canal to visualize the tympanic membrane. There are different sizes available, different shapes, different. This is also available. One with the slit is also available. One more commonly asked question: Why the color is black? Why why it is black? It is because of it will not reflect the light. Now what we are doing? We are seeing inside the cavities. Okay, your nose, throat are the cavities, and we are looking inside the cavities. So what will happen when you uh, see deep into the cavity? You have to focus the light into the cavity. Now, the, if the speculum is of steel or the, some uh, reflecting surface is there, what will happen? It will reflect light back to you, okay? And will not be able to see the uh, structures properly. And that exact that is exactly what we don't want. So that is why it is black in color, so that it will not reflect the light black. This is the audio, uh, sorry, otoscope, okay? Nine otoscope is there. Again, different sizes speculum are available. Off and on switch is there. It may have even single speculum atta uh, this attached to it. Okay, and it gives good view. Okay, single speculum. It has got a uh, ear speculum. Then the magnifying glass is there and rubber tube and the rubber bulb. Where it is used? It is used to for the fistula test. Okay, to increase and decrease the pressure in the external artery canal. The speculum is typically used. Then, this is a very common instrument. I mean, basically, it, it is liked by everyone. Yeah? All students pick up this instrument. I don't know why. So, this is an oral syringe, but you should know the parts of this syringe. What is this? This is a nozzle. This is a cylinder. And this is a piston. Understood? So, when you pull this out, the water will enter from here and when you push it, piston push it down, the water will uh, enter the external artery canal. Everyone should know the indications, contraindications of oral syringing, what are the complications of oral syringing. All these things are important. Okay. Then the room temperature, caloric test, that's other questions asked with this ear syringe. Okay. Then next instrument. See these two, these are both are mirror, okay? But one is straight and one is BAO net shaped. Understood like this. So the one which is straight is an indirect laryngoscopic mirror. So what is indirect laryngoscopic mirror? It is nothing but a handle and the mirror is there, okay? So where we use it? While doing indirect laryngoscopy, how to do indirect laryngoscopy? First, always perform the, explain the procedure to the patient. So, what you are going to do, unless because in this pro procedures like indirect laryngoscopy and posterior rhinoscopy, you, what you need is you need a patient's cooperation. Okay, if the patient will not cooperate, what will happen? The uh, there will be sensitive throat or patient will gag. Understood. So patient will get frightened and other things will happen. So that is why patient's cooperation is very, very important in these conditions. And that is why first thing what you do is uh, you explain the procedure to the patient. Understood? In posterior endoscopy as well as indirect laryngoscopy. Then what you do, you ask the patient to open the mouth put the tongue out. You are pulling the tongue out because you want to see the larynx. By pulling the tongue out, what you are pulling is pulling the larynx out. And then the visualization becomes easier. So that is why you pull the tongue out and ask the patient to open, uh, so to breathe through mouth. Okay? While mouth, patient is breathing through mouth, the soft palate will go up and the visualization of larynx becomes easier. So that is why we give all this instruction to the patient. Then what you do is you hold the tongue with the uh, middle finger and the index finger with sorry and the thumb. Index finger you retract the upper lip and then introduce the warm mirror. The mirror side of the instrument is warm, and then 
you see the structures everyone should know how to draw a diagram of the structures uh, seen on the indirect laryngoscopy as well as uh, you should know, be able to answer the question okay what are the structures seen on the indirect laryngoscopy start with posterior one third of the tongue then glosso epiglottic folds median as well as lateral then the epiglottis eri epiglottic fold arytenoid true cords false vocal cords ventricle is not very well seen but subglottic region can be seen then posteriorly what you see is a postricoid region and on either side of the laryngeal inlet is piriform fossa so these are the structures seen what are the advantage of this particular instrument this particular instrument has got many advantages advantages are patient if this is a first is opd procedure patient need not be admitted for it understood then it can be done under local anesthesia or no anesthesia the main advantage of this is that you can assess the vocal cord movement if you give general anesthesia what will happen patient is paralyzed and the movement of the vocal cord will not be appreciated so that is why the main advantage of this instrument you can identify you can check the movement of the vocal cord so these are the advantages disadvantages also are there like short fatty neck anatomical problems are there and you will not be able to because larynx is which, uh, placed more anteriorly understood lot of uh, this is there fat is there that is why short fatty neck you will it is difficult to visualize the larynx then in other conditions like um, Mm, sensitive throat again okay overhanging epiglottis all these are the anatomical difficulties okay patient keep on gagging so all these things plus there is inversion that we are seeing in the mirror image understood like lateral inversion is there so all these things will be there these are the disadvantages of this instrument now we will go to posterior rhinoscopy what is posterior rhinoscopy visualization of posterior part of the nose so for that what we need is a bionic sheet okay see the shape is different understood it is curved plus the mirror size is also less as compared to indirect laryngoscopy because there is a soft palate okay we have to go behind the soft palate and then visualize the larynx if the mirror size is too big we will not be able to pass it behind the soft palate so what are the instructions given to the patient in posterior rhinoscopy you ask the patient to first always describe the procedure to the patient then you ask the patient to open the mouth but tongue is kept inside only here we depress the tongue because we don't want to pull the larynx up we want to in fact it go to go down understood so you depress the tongue and patient is asked to breathe through nose because soft palate falls down understood so then warm mirror is passed behind the soft palate and then you visualize the structures because of this typical shape we will be uh, will not be blocking the um, field of the vision understood so again what are the structures visualized structures visualized include structures visualized include a posterior part of the nasal septum posterior part of the nasal cavities posterior part of the inferior middle sometimes superior middle turbinate uh, superior turbinate and meatae then uh, this is a com uh, important thing commonly asked what lies on the lateral wall of the nasopharynx nothing but a, it is uh, lateral wall of the nasopharynx what is uh, lies is it lies um, eustachian tube opening okay so eustachian tube opens on the lateral wall of the nasopharynx so that uh, that you have to tell and the posterior superior wall is the adenoids so remember uh, remember that understood so these are the structures visualize what are the different methods of doing nasolaryngoscopy and esopharyngoscopy is a commonly asked question in practical so we can do uh, in see nasopharynx is a blind space you have to do some scopy or something okay then only you will be able to visualize rigid nasopharyngoscopes are available this is posterior rhinoscopy is available then nowadays even the scopes are there okay so scopes uh, we can endoscope
okay from the nose we can introduce and go into the nasal pharynx and visualize it so these are the uh, different methods of doing nasal pharyngoscopy of course we can even examine under the uh, sorry a general anesthesia with retracting the soft palate with the um, rubber catheters okay then this is a tuning fork sorry this is a tuning fork tuning fork where it is used you all uh, already know that it is used in it is used in uh, tuning fork test like rennes webers okay and absolute bone conduction the parts of the tuning fork these are the prongs this is the shoulder and the foot plate is there understood so shaft and fork so different sizes are available different uh, numbers are available 256 512 and 1024 it is always in octave of 8 okay so all the test will be asked what are the different tuning fork test and other things discussion will go on that so what are this these are the instruments which are used in tonsillectomy okay what is it this draffins bipods okay this particular plate is kept below the neck of the patient and then you apply this bipods okay and this is a eaves tonsilla snare why this bipods are important because it holds the tongue depressor toy boyle davis tongue depressor is hold is held by this bipods okay so that uh, there is no assistant is required to depress the tongue understood then this is a eaves Tongue, uh, sorry, tonsillar snare. Okay, so what happens when you open this? The snare opens, the wire comes out. Understood? And which is passed inside the uh, tonsil, and then you crush and cut it. The advantage of this instrument, typical uh, this particular instrument, is it crushes and cuts the tonsils. Okay, so that uh, gives you hemostasis, better hemostasis. so all about tonsillectomy will uh, discussion will go on okay what is this this particular instrument is a double ended instrument it is a anterior pillar retract and this particular part is used for anterior pillar retraction and this particular part is used for dissection dissection of the tonsils so uh, in dissection method of tonsillectomy cold steel tonsillectomy is also same again the questions will be asked uh, regarding the different methods of doing tonsillectomy hot methods and cold methods okay what we are doing is a dissection what we are following here is a dissection method and we should do that this is a boyle davis tongue depressor with the mouth gag okay so everyone should know how to use this instrument and how to depress the tongue uh, the main advantage of this instrument is it doesn't require uh, assistant to go depress the tongue what is this this is a this is a adenoid uh, curate with the cage see this is the cage and curate previously they used to do adenoidectomy without tube without this uh, this so there are chances that what the structure we remove may fall into the throat and patient may aspirate it and that is why this cage was devised okay so this is the cage which holds the adenoid tissue which we have removed and this is a blade understood nowadays we do it on adenoidectomy under general anesthesia only same thing it is anterior retractor with the tonsillar dissector but this is not anterior it is only dissector only thing it is this one is sharp and this one is blunt okay so it is a tongue depressor with the mouth gag same thing you are seeing how to hold it and this is how you apply it understood this is ultra so this is a uh, uh, head end and this is a uh, leg end okay put it and this is the tongue which is depressed uh, by the boyle davis mouth gag and hold with the uh, draffins bipod here you can see the eaves tonsillar snare with the wire out okay so when you pull this out okay what you see is a wire comes out and when you push it like this you uh, wire should go inside completely again it is a hook 
uh, with the uh, for the basically foreign body remover. Okay, so wax soup and the foreign body remover. <clears throat> These are the different types of forces you should know. Okay, so. So what are this first thing is a lux force. So what is lux force? It is used in mm, uh, nasal polypectomy, okay, to remove the polyps and uh, in nasal uh, septoplasty surgery to remove the. Hair. Basically, what is there? The ends, uh, the blades are the uh, fenestrated for the better grip, and as well as it is uh, sharp edges, okay. So it cuts the tissue and do it, okay. So that is lux force. It is this is the tonsilla holding forcep. So tonsilla holding forcep, how it is used? The uh, what will happen? The uh, blades are always fenestrated, fenestrated because it gives good grip. Okay, but they are not sharp like look, uh, lux forcep. Okay, this here the blades are sharp. These are not sharp. Then these are the tonsilla hemostat okay it achieves hemostasis don't call it artery force because what bleeds after tonsillectomy is are the paratonsillar veins so it is not artery force but it is a tonsillar hemostat of course there are different sizes different uh, types are available of the tonsillar hemostat commonly asked one is a negus one okay so what is negus negus is curved again it is a long and uh, long instrument because so that go deep into the oropharynx plus it is curved so that aram say we can hold the tonsilla uh, bleeder and this is a uh, bayonet shape so it is wilson's the negus one is basically what happens this ring you can see it is a complete ring but in negus it is an incomplete ring so it is broken here so what we do is we take a knot keep it ready here in this ring okay and then you catch the bleeder and you just slide down the knot okay because of this incomplete ring the knot will come down understood like this and then it will hold the bleeder so that is the idea yeah this is a uh, lux forcep as i've told you the ends blades are fenestrated plus it is sharp sharp edges are there understood so uh, cuts and uh, so basically not used for tonsillectomy can be used but not ideal understood so it is uh, septoplasty and polyps and other things understood nose basically it can be used to take punch biopsy but not ideally uh, no. again same thing what is it saint clair thompson's adenoid curate with the cage here the cage is different understood you can remove the cage and uh, clean the instrument particularly. This is a pediatric site, different sizes are available. The discussion will go on adenoidectomy complications and other things. How will you treat complications? For adenoids and tonsils, it is a basic surgery, so you should know everything in detail as well as how to uh, control the complications. Okay, how will you treat the complications? So, hemorrhage in the tonsillectomy or hemorrhage after adenoidectomy is also should be. Uh, you should know the treatment of it. Understood? The indications, contraindications, uh, everything, procedure, all the things you should know about tonsil and adenoids. For septoplasty and for tympanoplasty, if you know the stages, steps or the principle of surgery, that is also enough. Understood? You should understand what is the procedure is. But in tonsillectomy, we'll ask you everything, even the procedure of the surgery, as I told you, all complications and how to treat the complications. That is also important for tonsillectomy. Okay. Then next is, this is a Quincy forcep. Okay. Can you see shape is again bayonet shape, so that won't offer surgeon's view. And this is arrow. Okay. Arrow shaped is there. See this. It is very sharp. The idea of this is uh, it will the whole instrument will not go in. Okay, tonsillar um, uh, peritonsillar abscess is very superficial, and if you there are many important structures which lie deep to it. Okay, you should not damage it. The idea is that that is why it is arrow shaped like this. So only this much instrument will go in. Hmm? The whole instrument will not go in. Only this much. So this is Quincy. The questions will be asked related to 
Quincy. Okay, all the questions related to Quincy will be asked. What is this? Again, full name you have to remember. Very examining examiners are fond of this name. Tilly, Lich, Witch, Trocar, and Cannula. Tilly, Lich, Witch, Trocar, and Cannula. What is Trocar? This is the Trocar. This is the Trocar, and this is the Cannula. Whenever you introduce the instrument, you introduce it with the trocar and the cannula. Cannula should come out like this so that this instrument becomes blunt or uh, not sharp. Understood? Then this is a 50 cc syringe is there attached to it. How to do intra puncture and indications, contraindications, everything will be asked and you are supposed to answer and remember this name also what is it tilly lich which trocar and cannula understood so this is uh, the instrument which you should know what is this this is killian's self-retaining nasal speculum we have discussed three nasal speculums. First is thudicum, second is St. Clair's long bladed nasal speculum, and third is Killian's nasal speculum. Just one second. Hello. I don't mean to phone you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you. So, Killian's long bladed nasal speculum. Okay. So it is um, uh, used for the examination of the nasal cavity, not examination, okay, we can use it, but basically it is used in surgeries like septoplasty, uh, uh, submucous resection, polypectomy, and other nasal surgeries, okay? This is the speculum which has got long, bladed, uh, long blades are there. So um, you can see the nasal cavity and Mm, it is used under anesthesia. So three nasal speculum you should know. The screw here, see, can you see the screw? Screw makes it self-retaining, okay? So this is self-retaining nasal, Killian's nasal speculum. Uh -huh. What is it? It is Freya's elevator, perichondrial elevator. You elevate the, see, whenever you're doing septoplasty or submucous resection, what you're doing? There is a cartilage and there is a perichondrium. So you have to elevate the perichondrium. So take an incision. Suppose this, this is a middle one is a cartilage. I don't know whether you are able to see it. So this three fingers. First middle one is a cartilage and on either side is a mucoperichondrium. Okay, so what you do is you take an incision here. You go on elevating the flap. Okay, then go on the other side. Go on elevating. So your cartilage is free now. Okay, mucoperichondrium on both sides. So that is how you do it. So for that you need this instrument, Freer's elevator, perichondrial elevator. Then there is something called as, what is it? Tilly's nasal packing forceps. Okay, so this is these are the blades and nasal packing forceps. So you want to keep the pack inside. So can you see when the blade is completely closed, so sorry, the forceps is completely closed, but the blades has got place in between. Okay, it is not approximating completely. This is because loose, uh, you know, the holding is not uh, prop, uh, is loose. Okay, so we want, we can keep the pack inside. And when you remove the forceps outside, the pack will not come out. So that is the idea. Okay, so this is nasal packing, nasal packing indications, contraindications, all will go on. What is this? This is Ballinger's swivel knife. It moves, this knife moves 360 degree. Here is the knife, okay? So it moves like this, rotate. Uh, used in submucous resection of septum. That is Ballinger's swivel knife. It is Hartmann's nasal speculum, the nasal packing force, nasal forceps, okay? So packing forceps, uh, I've told you what is there, gap is there in between. It is not holding here. It is. It can be used for foreign body removal and heart means so heart shaped or the triangular blades are there. Okay, it is not straight like that. Yeah, this is Walshams and Ash forceps commonly asked again in practicals. Uh, everyone should know. Ideally, uh, this one should be covered with the uh, one of this should be covered with the rubber 
uh, catheter. Okay, so again, this instrument is ash forceps. It is used for septal fracture. You can see there is a gap between two blades to hold the cartilage. If it is completely uh, obstructing, what will happen? It will crush the cartilage, which we don't want. Okay, so nasal injuries to elevate the since uh, fracture septum. Okay, this is used. This is ash forceps. This is Walsham's forceps to elevate the nasal bone fracture. The one with the rubber uh, catheter will come on the skin. This is a gouge, nasal gouge with a hammer. Okay, used for uh, rhinoplasty surgeries. Okay, I think my battery is running low. Okay, this is a periosteum elevator. So periosteum elevator, where right, it is used, it is used in. Uh, basically, this is a big one. Okay, so it is used in um, it is used in uh, tympanoplasty and mastoid surgery to elevate the to elevate the um, uh, periosteum from the bone. Okay, it can be used even in. Um, uh, Calvary lux surgery to elevate the periosteum over the maxillary sinus. What is this? Huh? This is a tracheal dilator. Again, this is an instrument which opens on closure where it is used, used in tracheostomy. Once you take an incision over the trachea, these are the tracheostomy tubes. The tube is not kept. What we keep is the Chevalier Jackson's middle tracheostomy tube. Okay. Everything about tracheostomy you should know. I've taken lectures about tracheostomy and included everything. So you should know this. Understood? I'm not going into detail of it. Five indications for tracheostomy is a commonly asked and it is a passing question. Understood? So you should at least know this because tracheostomy is a life-saving procedure. Understood? 